Good evening, my internet friends. Evan Benton of Evdog for Mayor here. And tonight we're looking at the curious case of Typhoid Mary. And of course, we're looking at this because of its uh, place as the sole <clears throat> justification for what is now being called asymptomatic spread. So, her dates, first of all, uh, Mary Mallon was born in 1869 in Ireland. She died in state custody in the state of New York in 1938. It was thought that she had contracted typhoid from her mother while she was in the womb um, because she never ever showed any signs of typhoid and claimed that she had never been sick with the disease. Very little is known about her life at all, which is extremely frustrating. She was discovered by a man named George Soper in 1906. Uh, George Soper was a sanitation engineer and a major in the U.S. Army. Uh, he had a Ph.D., but he was not a doctor, which uh, is important to a lot of people these days. He was not a doctor. He was not a uh, public health official, an epidemiologist of any kind. So I wasn't able to find out what his PhD was in, but he was a sanitation engineer. Um, you know, and so back in those days, of course, uh, you know, the fields were not as uh, rigidly, rigidly defined as they are today. So he could have had a PhD in, uh, you know, biology or something relevant, but I, I couldn't find that out. So anyway, <clears throat> he was hired uh, to privately investigate a typhoid outbreak at um, a summer home in Oyster Bay, New York. So the owners of the house were worried that they wouldn't be able to rent it out. Uh, in the summer of 1906, there was a typhoid outbreak, and he was hired to investigate it in the winter of 1906-1907 uh, because they were worried they wouldn't be able to rent it out for the next, the next season, the next summer. Um, people didn't know how typhoid worked. Um, they, they were afraid that it would just be the, the house having a bad reputation. People would worry about getting sick. So, he conducted a thorough examination of the house, including uh, taking bacterial samples from the septic tanks, uh, from the well. It was on a well. Um, however, the last case of the... Uh, typhoid in the house was September 6th, and he didn't get there, as I said, until the winter. So I don't know if that would have left enough time for the typhoid uh, bacteria to dissipate. No one had been in the house for three or four months at that point. He concluded, um, because there was no trace of typhoid in the house itself, that it had to have been the cook. Um, so, and through looking through her personnel files, he was able to link her to um, seven other outbreaks. Of course, as this is uh, Typhoid Mary we're talking about here. Um, in those other outbreaks, there were a total of uh, 24 cases and one death. Um, but there's a couple of problems with his analysis uh, from my reading, um, because he's claiming, uh, first of all, that as soon as she showed up on the scene, uh, people started getting typhoid and getting sick, and that wasn't true. Um, actually, three of uh, three of those seven outbreaks, she had been there for quite some time. And nine months in one case, 11 months in another, and three years in the third. She had actually uh, been working with families who never showed uh, typhoid during that time. And then um, another problem with his uh, reading of the cases that out of those 24 cases, 24 people who got sick, 17 of them were servants. So I don't know if uh, she was actually cooking for the servants. I'm sure that some of them she wasn't cooking for because they lived um, off-site and they lived, um, they were permanently attached to these uh, summer homes like they were gardeners. They lived there full-time and she would move into the house just for the summer with the family that was occupying it. Um, but regardless, uh, because they were servants, they lived with her and they had a lot of other opportunities uh, to get uh you know, sickened by her. They were sharing uh, toilet facilities, sharing uh, bathrooms, and things like that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Soper, PhD, 
confronted Mary in 1907 and asked her for a stool sample, whereupon she tried to stab him. Uh, he left, and so he didn't get the stool sample, of course, but he was convinced at this point, he says in his, uh, in his notes, that she was the source. And so she, he went to the uh, New York Department of Health, and he got them to go and round her up and they physically uh, restrained her, arrested her, and uh, kept her confined um, for at least two weeks at this point and took stool samples from her. Um, and most of the stool samples t tested positive for the typhoid bacteria. And so on that, on those grounds, she was locked up <coughs> in a North Brother Island, which is in the East River in uh, New York City there. So while she was quarantined, almost a quarter of her analyses were negative, which is really interesting. And along with that, I found a paper written in a, or published in JAMA in 1933, which says, quote, a carrier for typhoid may transmit the infection only at intervals, which may be separated by years of non-infective periods. End quote. So that's um, really problematic, I would say, for the theory of uh, you know asymptomatic carriers of the disease. Uh, how would you know if they're producing the bacteria? They're producing the bacteria. I can't understand how it would be you know turning on and off in their body. So at any rate, after three years, the New York State Health Commissioner decided that not to uh, keep uh, disease carriers such as, uh, Mary Mallon in isolation. <clears throat> and so it was a policy change. And, um, you know, we got to note there were other such cases like Mary. Um, in fact, the American Journal of Public Health noted, uh, quote, in 1937, there were 398 typhoid carriers under supervision in the upper part of New York state, exclusive of those in state institutions, unquote. So I don't know um, what supervision means. Obviously, they weren't uh, in in state institutions, right? They were being supervised, whatever that means. Um, but so there are many more cases besides just a typhoid Mary. So she was released uh, in 1910 and told to wash her hands and not be a cook anymore. But unfortunately, she couldn't make any money doing anything else other than cooking. So she went back to cooking under a fake name. Um, but unfortunately for her, there were only two placement agencies for cooks in the greater New York area. And they knew her by, by her face. So even though she changed her name, she couldn't uh, end up getting her, her jobs for uh, wealthy families, which she had done for so long. Um, and she ended up working at just uh, restaurants and things around New York City. Um, she still wouldn't wash her hands. Um, by all accounts, Mary Mallon, bless her heart, was a dirty lady. Uh, the families that she worked for said that she wasn't particularly clean. And uh, when the man Soper went up to, uh, he found her apartment, like a, really a flop house, uh, it was filthy. Um, she was sharing it with a with a man and with a big dog. So <clears throat> she was uh, living in squalor, basically, d despite having a, a decent job for the time. Um, and then back to the story. Uh, after cooking at all these different places, um, it, and it says that uh, it, as she was cooking in all these different places, she, the typhoid followed her wherever she went, but there's no proof or evidence of that, unfortunately. But finally, she ends up getting a job at a hospital um, where there is there is a typhoid outbreak. 25 people get sick at the hospital, and two of them, unfortunately, die. The head obstetrician calls Soper. He says, hey, I, I think I've got your uh, typhoid Mary here. He comes in and, and rounds her up, and uh, back to quarantine she goes in 1915 after five years of freedom. Um... I do feel it necessary to note that she, her uh, quarantine situation wasn't as bad as it's typically, uh, you know, recorded. She was given her own cottage. She was allowed off the island um, to take day trips into the city whenever she wanted to. 
And it seems like from, from the story of her life, she just had a hard time those five years and she couldn't make it because of course she'd been, she'd been blacklisted um, from working as a cook. So she, she was probably happy to, to go back into quarantine on uh, North Brother Island, but that's my own reading of it. Um, she had a stroke in 1932 and it ended up uh, paralyzed, never recovered, and she died in 1938. So again, the theory of uh, typhoid Mary and being a, being a carrier of typhoid is that she uh, got sick, when she was in her mother's womb, um, her mother got typhoid and passed it on to her. And then it, she suffered a massive, though asymptomatic, infection of her gallbladder, which caused her to uh, excrete the bacteria every time she would uh, go to the bathroom. And that's so that's the theory, uh, the, basically the, the explosive gallbladder theory, we'll call it. Um, the authorities wanted to remove her gallbladder, and then they would say, okay, well, you know, it's, if, we, if we remove your gallbladder, you can probably be let go. You, you won't be a danger anymore. Any, anymore. Uh, of course, she didn't. Um, and <clears throat> ultimately, uh, after she died, they didn't do an autopsy, and this is extremely problematic and controversial because that would have been the one thing that would approve their theory. So it's uh, she had no family. There would have been no one to object to such an autopsy, and it's it's uh, you know pretty un unbelievable. But it's been it's a big controversy. If you look into her life, if you look into the Typhoid Mary story, um, she, there are some people that say there was an autopsy, okay, and they found that uh, that poison gallbladder. Um, but Soper in his uh, writings that I was that I read in preparation for this video uh, maintain that there was no autopsy so it's, it's one of these weird things where you either you believe it or you don't and that's the whole point of this this story uh, but other controversies arose around her and that was basically that she was a poor Irish Catholic woman and she was working for wealthy presumably Protestant families and so a lot of people make it about the uh, the social justice narrative when we're talking about typhoid Mary um, but, you know, finally, in, on the controversy side of things, I just want to note that this was not a public health issue. Um, she was, the guy, Dr. Soper, was hired by a landlord who, um, was worried about his private, uh, house not being able to be rented out. So, you know, it wasn't like the government came in and stepped in and, and said, oh, there's a, there's an outbreak here and we need to find the source of it. Um, not at all. So let's go on before we um, talk about the, the, the foolishness of the theory. Let's talk about the, the disease itself. What is typhoid or typhoid fever? So it's caused by salmonella, which, yes, it's the same salmonella that causes, uh, you know, just food poisoning. Exact same even down to the, the subspecies. And it's, in fact, very difficult to differentiate uh, between the two. I found a 2019 paper which described a PCR test uh, that had just been developed. Uh, and we know, all know about the problems with PCR testing. But So besides that, before this PCR test was developed in, in 2019, it took uh, several days um, to... Uh, to culture a test, to, to, to culture the, the bacteria and to determine whether or not they were the uh, typhoidal strain or the non-typhoidal strain, as it's called. Uh, so I just looked that up because I wanted to know, um, is it reasonable to assume that in uh, 1907 they might have made a mistake uh, in, in diagnosing her with the typhoidal strain uh, as opposed to the non-typhoidal uh, strain of salmonella? And yes, it, it's completely reasonable. Um, again, they're the same subspecies. Uh, scientists don't actually know what, uh, what differentiates these, these two strains. Um, they believe that the typhoidal strain is adapted to human hosts. So typical salmonella, you know, can be found with, um, with birds, uh, and reptiles. And, um, the typhoidal strain is only among 
only found among humans. So it makes sense. It's been that it makes it. I think it sounds reasonable that it's been adapted to our our uh, physiologies, you know, and basically it, it goes through our uh, digestive system, makes us sick, and then we poop it out, and then someone eats that poop and they get sick, and so it's this kind of cycle, you know. It's a very, it's a similar cycle to what we see with like livestock parasites, right? Um, so I think it's reasonable. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, just dismissing typhoid. Okay, I don't think that typhoid is a is a conspiracy theory, like some other diseases. Um, and what it is is, uh, you know, basically it's a really bad food poisoning, right? It's similar to salmonella, um, but it can spread to other organs, right? It can cause a liver failure. It can cause hemorrhaging of the intestines and that which can cause you to bleed out and die. Uh, the treatment is antibiotics, which uh, Mary we did not have access to in her day. Uh, and even with treatment, the risk of death is uh, one to four percent. So it's a serious uh, thing, typhoid. Uh, the organism, the causal organism, was identified in 1880 by a German doctor Karl Eberth, and then a vaccine was developed in 1896 by Sir Almroth Wright, great name, and uh, notably he was not involved with the Pasteur Institute like so many of these uh, other vaccine creators. But uh, most importantly, uh, they knew that the cause of uh, typhoid fever was contaminated water, and so this Set up, set off a, a big campaign to uh, you know sanitize water systems to build more modern plumbing and things like that, and that was really great. Caused uh, you know many fewer people to die in in the interim years. So um, by the 1930s, typhoid was a disease of rural areas. So uh, you know big cities that had their own water systems, people weren't getting typhoid as much, and then people out in the country who were dependent on wells. You know, if the well were too close to the uh, septic tank, there could be some contamination issues there, or if they were getting water from uh, the stream and the upstream, there would be, you know, some uh, people going to the bathroom. That could cause uh, some contamination of the water. Uh, but even when um, sanitary water systems were installed, some places like New York City, in the time of Mary, uh, still experienced sporadic typhoid outbreaks. So uh, the theory of asymptomatic, of asymptomatic carriers was created um, to explain why people were still getting sick. So uh, keep in mind that, yes, um, Ignaz Semmelweis has written his seminal paper in uh, 1869, um, but washing hands was still not accepted in these days. Um, hard to believe, but it was, you know, it was controversial whether or not that would help to spread to, that would help to uh, um, stop the spread of diseases, which of course now we know it does. So probably, you know, if they if they had accepted that, they wouldn't need to have come up with the theory of asymptomatic carriers, and we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But I digress. Uh, the theory of asymptomatic carriers of typhoid still has legs. There is a paper published in Trends in Microbiology in 2014. Um, and they even found evidence, evidence of a colonization of the gallbladder, um, which is pretty interesting. But the problem is that that evidence was found because presumably because the people got their gallbladders taken out. So presumably they were symptomatic, unlike uh, typhoid Mary. Um, also, in these cases of uh, these people having their gallbladders taken out and finding the evidence of of uh, the colonization by the Salmonella bacteria, uh, they ha had documented cases of typhoid. So it's a completely different presentation um, where basically the idea is some percentage of people who get sick with typhoid never fully clear that infection and they're still, it's a colonized a bit of them and it's causing problems. But again, the key is it's causing problems. It's causing pain for them, it's causing gallbladder symptoms and eventually they, they get their uh, gallbladder taken out. Uh, but until they do, um, they can be spreading the bacteria, shedding the bacteria as it were.
And interestingly, this uh, 2014 article had the same in incidence as the historical literature um, for the number of patients who don't clear the infection, which was about two to five percent. I just thought that was interesting. So um, to recap, then uh, she never Mary Mellon never had typhoid. She never washed her hands, which is probably the problem. Um, she was discovered because a landlord hired one Dr. George Soper, a sanitation engineer, to privately investigate his house because a typhoid epidemic, typhoid outbreak, had occurred there, and he was worried about renting it out. So it wasn't a public health concern. It wasn't the government. It was a private individual who later got the government involved, yes. But uh, anyway, she was associated with eight outbreaks of typhoid fever, um, and here I want to note that an outbreak can mean just one case, and in three of these these eight cases, that's all it was. It was one person, um, an outbreak of one. So uh, Dr. Soper assumed that the people were infected by eating her cooking, um, but most cases were among fellow servants. So, and again, some of those servants may have eaten her food, some of them did not, but the point is that they had a lot more opportunities to uh, you know, exchange, uh, you know, to have contact with her bodily fluids if that was the cause of, if that was the source of the, of the uh, salmonella bacteria, then, um, then Dr. Soper was studying. And he stated that each outbreak started immediately after she was hired, but in three of those eight outbreaks, she had been at the location for a minimum of nine months. Her stool tested positive most of the time for the typhoid bacteria. Um, but as I noted before, it's, it's still hard, and undoubtedly it was harder in that day to differentiate between typhoidal and non-typhoidal strains of salmonella bacteria. And then finally, there was no autopsy performed, so the theory that her gallbladder was, the, was uh, super infected or colonized uh, was never tested. So now, um, the reason I'm making this video, you know, of course, it links to <clears throat> the asymptomatic sp spread garbage, um, but it's just another incident where we're basically given no evidence and we're expected to decide, do you believe the official story or don't you? And of course, the truth is just much more complicated and much more interesting. So, you know, and she's the sole justification for asymptomatic spread. She was, according to Wikipedia, she was the first case in history of quarantining someone on this rationale. I'm not sure that was true. It's Wikipedia, but um, that's what it says. And um, just to be clear, I'm not disputing the link between Mary Mallon and these typhoid outbreaks, okay? She was there. Um, she's worth investigating. I'm just saying maybe it's because she didn't wash her hands. Um... Maybe we don't need to uh, concoct this cockamamie theory of the exploding gallbladder, all right? Um, and it, again, it's an example of uh, the public health response, which I said it's not public health, but it became public health, okay? It, it originally started with a, someone having a, his house privately investigated, but it went to the government, all right? But it's not the government, you know what I'm saying? It's not the government trying to go out and find you know, carriers, basically. That's that's the point there. But the public health response is all about making people feel powerless, which is just so depressing and telling, you know, that, you know, in, instead of um, the real, it, the real thing should have just been wash your hands. Mary, Mary, girl, wash your hands, all right? You can't serve food unless you wash your hands. And if she says no, then yeah, lock her up, right? Don't let her cook. Um, but instead of making it about that, we made it about this uh, this collectivist thing of you know we've got to we've got to put up with um, her loss of freedom, and uh, it's almost like uh, when you're reading about ty Typhoid Mary, it's almost like you're reading about the uh, propaganda about the atom bombs at the end of World War II, where they're saying, well, you know, yeah. But it's, there's a lot of complicated 
um, controversial issues there, but ultimately we had to. We had to uh, drop those bombs to stop further loss of life, right? That's what they say about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and so with Typhoid Mary, you know, it's, well, we, it's never nice to lock someone up, but, you know, you might have to. That's the, that's the harsh moral, right? So it's, it's just priming us for this kind of thing. And it might all just be based on junk. It might all just be based on garbage. That's what I'm saying. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't think that if you listen to my retelling of the story here, it really makes sense. I don't think it passes the smell test, as they say. So, again, we're, we're being herded into this false choice. Is she or isn't she, right? And uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated. And, frankly, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, the story of Typhoid Mary is, is pretty ridiculous. So, um, and, I, and that's about it for me. I think, you know, that's a good wrap-up. So I think you'll have something to talk about around the water cooler the next time you're allowed to go to work. Uh, um, uh, not really, you know, not really high school book report material here, but it's, it's just, um, some fascinating stuff, a lot to talk about, a lot to get into. Um, and you know, this is what we're doing all day, every day at Ebb Dog from Air. So if you like this kind of stuff, tune in for more, um, comment down below. Uh, subscribe to the channel, and if you can support my work in any way, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, so that was it. My name is Evan Benton. This is Evdog from Air, and thank you. Have a good night.